Okay, hang on one moment. Okay, so we are going to get started now and I would like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. And I would like to welcome you to tonight's webinar on the latest updates from this year's San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. I would like to thank all of our speakers for presenting tonight. And just a reminder, we are going to take questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, you can type them in at the chat box and we will take as many questions as time allows. And with that being said, I'm going to turn the program over to our first speaker, Dr. Sylvia Adams. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, this will stop other screen sharing. So I will share my screen. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you can see me, see the slides. Yep, and everything uh, looks good. Fantastic. Uh, yes, okay, great. So um, this is um, a wonderful opportunity to update um, everyone on the progress uh, that's been presented at the annual San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting, which was um, a hybrid meeting this year. And we have on the speaker panels, experts, um, the chief of breast surgery, Dr. Freya Schnabel, the uh, chief of the breast medical oncology team at uh, NYU Long Island, Dr. Diabrio, the uh, director of clinical research as, uh, at the main campus in uh, NYU, Dr. Chen. And we have also the, uh, the DMG lead of radiation oncologist, Dr. Gerber joining us uh, shortly. So as you can see, breast cancer is the most common cancer um, in the uh, in women uh, worldwide, and its incidence is rising. So uh, this is a very um, very timely uh, time to, to give you the update. Um, just as a um, as a introduction to our breast cancer center, we have um, many many uh, physicians uh, scientists working together to uh, deliver patient centered care that is um, really uh, supported by innovative research in our institution. Uh, we personalize treatments and uh, really have a very a good interdisciplinary um, access to, um, for, to care for you. And uh, we also have uh, very exciting support programs. Um, here is uh, one of the patients with Dr. Schnabel discussing high-risk care uh, and one of our breast surgeons in the OR as well. So um, I will cover in the first 15 minutes, the update from the um, meeting in um, San Antonio, Texas for triple negative breast cancers. Um, my disclosures are not that relevant, um, but we will cover two major topics. One is immunotherapy for triple negative breast cancer. And then the second topic is uh, the antibody drug conjugates, which is a newer class of, of medicines that um, seem to be uh, very, very active. So starting with immunotherapy, we will first um, discuss the early triple negative uh, settings. So these are patients who are deemed um, operable or can be, um, the, the tumors can be actually um, downsized by, by a preoperative uh, systemic treatments. Um, so this is the early triple negative breast setting, but we also will cover the advanced disease settings. These are patients um, who have uh, metastatic um, disease or had recurrent disease. So for early triple negative breast cancer, and I'll show you some slides just to um, give you the real data, but um, you may know that in 2021, uh, there was an FDA, uh, which is a regulatory agency in the United States approval of the first immunotherapy in, um, in early triple negative breast cancer or in early breast cancer in general. And in this, um, uh, this study, what was called the Keynote 522 study was a very large uh, study that randomized women or assigned them by chance and men to the standard chemotherapy that we use before surgery, com combining usually four chemotherapy drugs um, versus those same chemotherapy drugs plus an immunotherapy, a medicine that's given intravenously. And um, the, the results were, were shown earlier um, in um, you know, last year and then led to the approval of, of this for, um, for us to use in the clinic. But the San Antonio presentation looked at certain subtypes of, of these uh, women that participated in the study. 
And it really confirmed, um, and I'll show you the, the graphs, but it really confirmed that the benefit of adding the immune components to the chemotherapy component was really useful for all patients. So the, um, uh, the next study is um, in advanced breast cancer. Um, this was called Keynote five, uh, 355. If I could get the numbers, I'll keep them straight. So uh, this uh, regimen had been approved in 2020 already for the treatment of advanced triple negative breast cancer. And uh, in this study update, uh, they looked at, um, at certain tumor characteristics to see if an additional group of women could potentially benefit. So the original approval was for tumors that on staining of, of the tumor slide uh, would show a positivity of at least 10% of the cells in the area of the cancer for PDL1. That is the target of the chemotherapy pembrolizumab. And um, the, the approval um, required at least 10% to be positive. Otherwise, um, the patient would not be eligible. So these researchers went back into the original data set and looked at what about the women from 1% to 9% uh, positivity of PDL1. And that was really important um, for the reason that we knew that this treatment would not work if you had um, negative uh, PDL1 stain. So anybody um, under 1% or zero did not have any benefit, but we really didn't know about the, the group of women between one and nine. And I'll show you the data. It's crystal clear. It does not work in that group of patients. So we don't need to add it um, for, that, um, for that group of, of uh, patients and therefore not even um, uh, used half the toxicity for, for that. So the, the, the second part of, of uh, updates are uh, newer drugs. Immune therapy has been studied, uh, as you could imagine, at least for a decade and um, in, in breast cancer, probably close to that uh, decade. But um, the newer drugs are antibody drug conjugates. And what that means is an antibody is basically a protein or an immune defense mechanism that is immunotherapy. And it's actually really targeting a cancer cell toward um, a, a flag on the tumor cell. So the antibody binds to the, um, to the tumor cell, but it also carries, we call it a smart weapon. It carries the chemotherapy. So it does not have to be given, um, you know, just to the same concentration throughout the body. It can be still given intravenously, but then it goes into the cancer area and binding to the cancer cell and delivers the chemotherapy onto the, or into the cancer cell and therefore you can actually give much higher doses of chemotherapy because the, you know, it's not as toxic. And um, they have made lots of progress in, um, in triple negative breast cancer. And we actually have already one approved drug in triple negative breast cancer called saxituzumab. And as you will hear probably later from Dr. Diabrio covering the HER2 positive breast cancers, uh, there is, there's multiple agents approved and they are unbelievably unbelievably effective. Um, they can even treat uh, breast cancers that have already been refractory to many other chemotherapies. And that sometimes that duration is, is long, longer term. So this is really um, an exciting um, area of, of research and of clinical trials. And I would like to also um, mention that um, you should always um, look at um, larger academic centers to see if there's access to clinical trials. Um, so the trial that was presented at the San Antonio meeting is a, um, it's a phase one study, meaning the earliest uh, clinical investigation where typically one looks for the correct dosing in, in patients. And, um, and once that dosing is established, they also obviously look for, does it work in, in some of the uh, tumors? Does it shrink tumors? So in this study called the Tropion Pan Tumor 1 study, meaning that it was not just breast cancer, but it included many, many other solid tumors. Um, the, the study cohort of breast tumors that were triple negative was shown at the meeting. And there was some, there was some uh, data showing that there is shrinkage of, of, uh, of tumors in, in women um, getting these uh, medications. And even some of them were durable. And I'll show you that, um, that plot. So um, this is all I want to cover in my talk. So we have about probably 10 minutes to, um, to go over 
less than 10 minutes. We have five minutes to show you the data. So I'm gonna just cruise through them. And um, um, if anybody wants any further information, obviously you can reach out to, um, to NYU or your physician to discuss it. So the uh, study that is early triple negative breast cancer, the immunotherapy addition to the backbone chemotherapy. And this is the survival analysis. So there was a difference between the green um, outcome for women, that is women surviving without any evidence of uh, breast cancer versus the, uh, the one in, um, in purplish um, maroon color that, um, that is just the women receiving chemotherapy. So there is a, there's a difference. And, um, and when we look at these um, analysis uh, by, by subtype of or subset of patients, uh, what disease stage two versus three, um, lymph node involvement um, or any other uh, things such as um, uh, markers in the blood or menopausal status, there was not a single group that really benefited more than the other. So this confirmed it works across um, all patients. This is the metastatic study that, um, that we talked about where uh, pembrolizumab was added to chemotherapy, a different type of chemotherapy per doctor's choice. And um, in, in this study, um, as I mentioned, the approval by the FDA is only for patients whose tumors express PDL1 in, in at least 10%. And you see the CPS score on the left, uh, 10 and greater is the one where it's approved in. But the, uh, the, um, the benefit is really not there for women uh, or men who have the CPS score of one to nine. And as we knew before, it's, it's negative or there's no benefit if um, there is PDL1 negativity. So this was, um, this was the survival data and now this is progression-free survival, similar data where it just tells you that the, you know, one is stable without the cancer growing. And this is the, the third um, study that uh, looked at the antibody drug conjugate in advanced triple negative tumors. These are uh, patients who had received prior treatments. And actually I can show you, um, this is the, the schema of the antibody in green, and then the linker in, um, uh, in blue linked to this um, chemotherapy uh, that is very, very uh, potent. So um, here, we, we talked about that these patients had um, metastatic disease and they had as a, as a median, probably three prior um, treatment uh, lines in the metastatic setting. And um, this is the um, quite impressive, um, we call this spider plot. So what you see in these is that on the left side, you start out for all the patients at, at zero, meaning that they are the tumor uh, size is being normalized to zero. So somebody with a three centimeter tumor is put on zero. And then at the time of, of scans, which is typically done at um, you know six weeks or two months, you look at the shrinkage or the increase in tumor size, or if it's remaining stable. So if it's stable, the tumor and the line for that one patient would remain on zero. If it goes down, if it's shrinkage, let's say from three centimeters to two centimeters, you would have a 30% reduction and you can hit down 30% and you see that line, we call that a partial response. So you can see that actually the majority of patients had shrinkage of their cancer. And then we look at the length of the shrinkage and that's, um, um, you can see it's pretty impressive by, um, by you know, for women with um, advanced um, disease who had multiple prior treatments, the typical duration of, of, of benefit for chemotherapy is just a couple of months, two to three months or so. So here we, we actually are, um, are hopeful that there is longer term benefit. So um, these are the numbers that there was a um, clear shrinkage of, uh, of tumor in a third of the patients, which is quite good. But there are some safety issues um, that need to be handled better. So again, this was an early phase trial, um, phase one, and, um, and there's going to be some uh, further follow-up studies where, where things get prevented. Um, this is all from the triple negative um, uh, perspective. I do thank you for your attention and I will pass the microphone on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams. 
Okay, next up is medical oncologist, Dr. Nina DeBreo. Dr. DeBreo, do you wanna try sharing your slides again? If not, I can definitely do it for you. Sure, let me do that now. Okay. I'm gonna see if I can pull this up now. Let's see, okay. how does that work? Let's see, you're, it says you've started to, yes, you're up. <laughs> oh, wonderful, all right. So let me, let me start from the uh, top. Um, Please bear with me for one second. All right, there we go. So um, Sylvia has very nicely set me up for, um, you know, a discussion of um, some of the uh, drugs that we have in the HER2 space. Um, and, and, you know, the vast advances that we've made in HER2 positive uh, breast cancers. So without further ado, I have no disclosures. Um, just a quick primer, we, we know the HER2 receptor is a transmembrane receptor across the membrane and overexpression of that HER2 protein uh, occurs because of amplification of the HER2 gene in about 20 to 25% of women with breast cancer. So it's a, not, not the majority of women, but it's certainly a, you know, considered more aggressive uh, and is treated differently. Uh, targeting the HER2 receptor uh, is, is really because we know the structure of this receptor. There are uh, antibodies that work on the outside or what we call uh, extracellular uh, portion of this receptor. Um, and there's three of them that may be familiar to you, um, uh, tristuzumab, pertuzumab, and a drug that was approved in 2020, magatuximab. And then there's the antibody drug conjugates that Sylvia so um, eloquently discussed just now. Uh, in the HER2 space, the target is the HER2 receptor, and there's different chemotherapies that are attached to these uh, sort of missiles, uh, and they directly target these, this HER2 receptor and deliver the payload of the chemotherapy into the cells. Two of them are familiar, TDM1, uh, commercially known as uh, Katsala, uh, and TDXD, which we now uh, call HER2. There's a new one that uh, there was some data at San Antonio, which I won't cover today, but this is down coming through the you know, pipelines. Um, and the last uh, group that we have is the uh, anti-HER2 small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are generally oral medications that work below the cell membrane or intracellularly, and they prevent the uh, transcription or the, uh, the transmission of uh, signals downstream. Uh, there are a few of these that are familiar again, lipatinib, neratinib, and the newest kid on the block, tucatinib or tukisa. Uh, and there's one drug that was just uh, shown in San Antonio to have some benefit in a trial that was mainly done in Asia. It's called uh, pyrotinib. Um, so the timeline of HER2 uh, is very different, I think, from triple negative, uh, because we've seen a rapid acceleration of uh, these drugs that are available to us, especially in the last decade or so. This is just showing you right from the time we first identified HER2, how far we've come. And this is also very heartening to know because our survival times have increased. Uh, we've been able to tailor therapy better uh, by understanding the biology of this disease uh, and by harnessing that receptor. Um, so the clinical use of HER2 therapy is where we are right now at the end of 2021. And again, we divide this you know, in all cancers to early stage and, and advanced stage. Uh, we know there are different challenges at each group. In our early stage HER2 positive cancers, in general, the theme is to try to de-escalate, to try to minimize the use of chemotherapy, if you will, because we know that there are a lot of them are driven by the HER2. So akin to what happens with our estrogen positive uh, group of patients, why not use a target? Uh, in, other, in other situations, we wanna try to use the strategy to try to treat cancers before a surgery, and then based on what the response is, we may try to optimize treatment at the back end. So those are the strategies that we continue to see, uh, you know, moving the needle forward in at San Antonio. Uh, and in the metastatic setting, actually, is where we saw uh, some new data uh, in the, in the, uh, at San Antonio. The goals really are to overcome resistance. We want patients to be, live longer and longer, long, healthy lives. We want to use less treatment as, uh, and use one treatment for as long as possible. An area of particular interest is brain metastases, which I'll cover in a little more detail. Uh, and finally, looking at heterogeneity, you know, we know HER2 is not all three plus HER2. There may be some HER2 low disease. There may be mutations in HER2 that have different um, uh, therapy choices. Uh, so brain mets in HER2 is really the focus of San Antonio. It was really the big brain met year. And we know it's the area of unmet need. 30 to 50% of patients with HER2 metastatic disease at diagnosis do unfortunately develop brain metastases. Several theories behind this. Uh, some thought is that the antibodies don't penetrate the blood-brain barrier, they're large molecules, which may be true in some cases. Maybe the brain mets are biologically different from the primary tumor. 
uh, radiation has traditionally been the mainstay of therapy and it still uh, is a very valid uh, way of treating brain mets. And then there's a particular area of brain metastases, what we call leptomeningeal disease, where cancer is in the spinal fluid or the lining of the brain, which is especially hard to treat. So we know that HER2 positive cancers, um, this is uh, the one um, you know, handicap we have. This is the one barrier that we need to overcome. I won't belabor this. I know uh, Sylvia has gone over this, and this is uh, the antibody drug conjugate structure. As we discussed, uh, these are the two uh, the three drugs that I have mentioned, two of them on the market already, and one coming down the pipeline. Uh, ADCs actually work in two ways. They work uh, in the classical mechanism, which we just discussed. Uh, you have an antibody to a drug, and they deliver the drug directly to the cell. But they also release chemotherapy molecules around, and so they may be able to kill other types of cells, not necessarily just HER2, but also other cancer cells that don't necessarily express HER2, something we call the bystander killing effect. And that's something that uh, we'll be seeing in other tumor types as well. So there are some differences between the two big uh, HER2 driven antibodies. Uh, number one, the chemo part uh, with the two drugs is different. Uh, the drug to antibody ratio, something that Sylvia alluded to as to how potent these drugs are, is slightly lower with TDM1. It's uh, seven, almost eight to one uh, in, the, in the case of NHER2. Um, they, they both bind to HER2, but there may be more efficacy in the, in the case of NHER2 in terms of the bystander killing effect. And of course, the big difference is side effects. Uh, we see a slight difference here. You see platelets and high liver functions with the TDM1 uh, and a little more of the interstitial lung disease uh, that, uh, again, we've had some reassuring news from San Antonio this year that it, you know, not as significant or severe as we first anticipated. Uh, so the Destiny 03 breast trial was probably the blockbuster trial of 2021, uh, and San Antonio reaffirmed that for us. It wasn't new data, but we already know that um, you know this trial showed a dramatic benefit in patients who got unher2 over uh, Ketsala or, or TDXD versus TDM1. The one thing I want to point out since we're on the theme of brain meds is that this, can, this trial did not include patients who had untreated or active brain meds. They did include patients who had treated disease and who were stable, but it did not have patients who had not had any uh, you know, prior radiation there. Um, the overall uh, results were already presented. There was a 72% reduction in the risk of death compared to and progression compared to TDM1. This was a pretty dramatic uh, progression-free survival benefit. Um, and that was that theme remained consistent with longer follow-up. But the brain meds part of Destiny 03 was presented uh, at San Antonio this year. And in patients with 36 patients who had treated brain meds, who were treated with TDXD, there was actually a 60 something percent response and 10 of whom had a complete response, which means that the tumors completely disappeared even without any targeted radiation therapy to the brain. And in um, patients with TDM1, there was a response too. So, you know, it's not that the drug doesn't work, it just was less effective. Again, opening up new avenues for approaching brain meds. What was really fascinating was the progression-free survival in patients with brain metastases was 15 months in patients with the TDXD compared with three months in the TDM1 arm. So really um, has moved the needle dramatically forward. So in 2022, we anticipate that the TDXD will sort of move up uh, especially in patients who have treated brain metastasis, which is where the data is. Though I have to say that there are some other trials presented at an earlier conference where uh, they are including patients with uh, active brain meds, and we're starting to see some glimmers of response. But most encouraging was that the rate of interstitial lung disease was really not very high. This is a side effect that we're very cognizant of. There was some hair loss, as you can see, less than 50%. Uh, in the majority of patients, and about 10% did have some uh, higher, more than 50% or grade two. Um, the next really big trial was the HER2-CLIMB trial, which is using tucatinib uh, or tukisa in combination with trastuzumab and zaloda or capecitabine uh, compared to just the, uh, the two uh, other drugs alone. Now, the, what was interesting about this trial is one of the only trials that allowed active untreated brain metastases. And so this earlier data had already been presented. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the brain meds part of the study. Uh, the overall survival in patients with brain metastases, all comers, was actually much longer when they, when they re-evaluated uh, this at longer follow-up, 21 versus 12.5. So this is really uh, another huge weapon in our arsenal against brain meds. Um, and in patients with active brain meds compared to those with treated brain meds, it was just as long. So it really shows the power of these drugs to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. 
So the conclusions really were there was a nine month improvement in all patients with brain metastases and including those with active brain nets. So one can imagine a situation where we may not need to use radiation in all patients, knowing that there are some toxicities for whole brain radiation, for example, uh, and we may be able to uh, minimize that and use systemic therapy to treat uh, brain metastases. Uh, there were some side effects, of course, uh, but generally only about 5.7% of patients who had the combination uh, had to stop treatment uh, compared to 3% who had the non tocatinib containing regimen. Um, quickly, uh, because left to meningeal disease is such a such a a hard disease to treat, a very small trial uh, that look, looked at 17 patients who had untreated leptomeningeal uh, metastases from HER2 disease. They did get the same drug to catenib in the same combination as the HER2 climb. And they found that the survival was 10 months compared to what we generally see in historical controls, which is just four to five months. So it's a first sort of glimmer that we may be making a difference in, in these patients. Now, obviously it would be fascinating to see what UNHER2 does in this space, uh, but for the first time we're starting to see that we have some options for patients uh, with what we uh, you know, have so far thought has to be very poorly, uh, very uh, poor prognosis. Uh, very quickly about early stage disease, we are really just reinforcing what we've learned all along, that we want to try to optimize or de-escalate some of the treatment choices. Uh, we know that not all tumors need two or three chemotherapy drugs, even though HER2 positive cancers tend to be more aggressive. We know that the HER2 driven, the HER2 driver is, is really more important. And so uh, there were no major updates, but these are ongoing trials called the COMPASS trial, which is trying to use less chemotherapy in combination with HER2 biologics for smaller cancers. This is currently open at both our campuses uh, on uh, and, uh, NYU campuses, Long Island and the city. Uh, and what it allows us to do is use less chemo before. And then if there's no full response, we can actually optimize this by randomizing people to another trial where you can use either Kitsila, TDM1, or combine that with tucatinib. So again, great questions to be asked uh, in both situations. Um, similar to that is another trial called the ATTEMPT trial, which is using a drug called, uh, using TDM1 in place of Taxol for certain patients with very small HER2 cancers. Uh, and this one is just opened at NYU sites and uh, we're encouraged to see whether we could use less chemotherapy in these earlier stage cancers. So very quickly, I'm making a pitch for what we have open. A HER2 has come a long way, but in early stage cancers, these are our trials that we have open. Um, in the metastatic space, we also have trials looking at these wonderful drugs, trying to find new combinations and all with the idea of moving the needle further. Um, so in summary, we know it's more aggressive, even the smaller ones, but we know we can de-escalate chemotherapy safely if we combine them with uh, very rational combinations of the HER2 drugs. And then we can optimize treatment at the back end for our early stage patients. Brain mets are an unmet need, but clearly some glimmer, some light at the end of the tunnel with these newer drugs. And we're continuing to see these ADCs, not just in HER2 positive cancers, but also using them for other tumor types because of this bystander effect, uh, which will probably be a nice segue into the other tumor type that we're gonna talk about, but more to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeBreo, that was great. Okay, moving on to our next speaker, I would like to welcome Dr. Nancy Chan, who is a medical oncologist. Dr. Chan, are you able to pull up your slides? It's sharing as we speak. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yep, looks great. Great. Thank you everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about the San Antonio updates for hormone positive breast cancer. Um, and in the next 15 minutes, I hope to cover as much as I can. There's a lot to talk about. I have no disclosures. So I would like to kick it off with the updates from the oral surge results um, from the Emerald study. This is our search for a better hormone therapy partner. Next, I'd like to give an update on the pool analysis of the Mona Lisa CDK46 inhibitor study with ribocyclib. And we also have very importantly updates from the responder trial, which told us that we can safely omit chemotherapy in a subpopulation of women. And one of the, I was able to go to San Antonio in person. And so one of the most exciting part is actually to look at the ongoing studies and looking, looking at what is to come um, in the future conferences. So I want to give you updates on ongoing studies, the alternate and Ladera, which I'll expand. And also importantly, 
um, I will end with risk reduction strategies, um, which we always, always talk about with our patients in clinic. So quickly to go over a brief timeline in modern medicine with the use of hormone therapy. In 1896, Sir George Beetson actually reported his, his patients, three premenopausal women who had a clinical response by surgical removal of their ovaries. And this started the um, estrogen manipulation as a treatment for breast cancer. In 1950s, Elwood Jensen actually identified what we now know as the estrogen receptor. And it took another 25 years to um, develop and approve tamoxifen as the first estrogen receptor, uh, um, selective estrogen receptor modulator. And for the next two decades, tamoxifen was the first line hormonal therapy um, for breast cancer. In the 1990s, for postmenopausal women, a newer class of hormonal therapy, the aromatase inhibitor, were um, discovered and approved. And then moving forward to 2002, fulvestrin, which is an estrogen receptor degrader, was approved. But it took us another couple of years to figure out the correct dosing in 2010. And in the past decade, we've been utilizing the hormonal therapy backbone with the approval of several targeted therapy, starting with Everolimus in 2012, the CDK4-6 inhibitors, the PI3 kinase inhibitor, Pelisip. And as you can, if you take a step back and look at this timeline, the development and advancement of drug um, and targeted therapy has become quicker and quicker, and that is always an encouragement to us. So starting off with the Emerald study, this is in utilizing oral selective estrogen receptor degrader. So as you, as you recall, in 2002, fulvestrin is an intramuscular injection of the same class of drug that was approved. Um, the intramuscular injections may be painful for many patients, and it, it, it does require patients to come into clinic to get these injections. So this is an oral pill that um, works similarly but actually in preclinical data has shown to be even more effective than fulvestrin. So quickly how the estrogen receptor works and how the drug works. So we're looking at this um, panel over here, the, the purple cup-like figures represent at the estrogen receptor. They sit at the cell surface. And when the oral surge in red binds to the estrogen receptor, it prevents it from moving into the nucleus to cause div cell division by degrading the entire complex. So it's highly effective. And again, we highlighted that nearly two decades have passed since the last endocrine therapy fulvestrin was approved. So it's about time. And in the phase one studies, the drug was um, shown to be extremely effective in a heavily pretreated patient population. So these are patients who have re received more than three, four lines of therapies in the metastatic setting. This is the design of the Emerald study. It is a large phase three randomized design um, of, of elestrocin versus the investigator's choice of hormonal therapy. And as you can see, um, Patients are, who receive elestrins are in green, and those who did not receive elestrins are in blue. The, the drug was associated with a 30% reduction in the risk of progression or death in all of the patients who had ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. When we look at these tumors who harbor a specific mutation, the ESR1 mutation, the response is even greater a 45% reduction in risk of recurrence and death in patients. So this is really um, encouraging. The overall survival data um, is not ripe yet. I think that it will be reported either late in 2022 or early next year. Now, what are the side effect pro um, profile of these drugs? Um, we know that aromat with aromatase inhibitors, um, the oral oral um, drug that we utilize for um, postmenopausal women, the the major side effects are arthralgia or joint stiffness, and it can be really debilitating for some patients. It also causes bone density loss. So, looking at the oral surge, 
we can see that the majority of side effects in blue um, are mild or um, grade one or two nausea, not a lot of joint aches. Um, there were very few serious um, nausea or any, any um, grade of um, three or four, so highly um, debilitating side effects from this class of drug. So it looks like overall that it's well tolerated. And so this is the first oral SIR that's demonstrated a st statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement um, in progression-free survival. And this is exciting, and we really look forward to seeing the overall survival analysis too. Now, we also looked at one of the um, ongoing studies, the Ladera study. This is a multi-center international study that randomizes the oral SIRD, another, another, um, another type of oral SIRD with the physician's choice of endocrine therapy. This is studying patients in the early stage breast cancer population. So instead of taking something like tamoxifen or Fomara for five years, patients would be randomized to have the opportunity to take the oral surge for five years. And hopefully the improved, the projected um, improved toxicity profile would help patients to stay on these highly effective drugs for longer. And we also will be a participant as a site um, in this study. So our patients um, we'll be able to take advantage of this opportunity to go on study. Next, I'd like to talk about the updates from Mona Lisa. And this is a study of ribocyclib. This study um, that was updated actually pooled um, all of the ribocyclib study samples and did genomic um, assay testing on these tumor samples. So when we talk about luminal A and luminal B, these are the hormone positive breast cancer patients that we want to focus on. So the dark blue and the light blue. Again, um, the ribocyclib study consistently in the pool analysis show that there's overall survival benefit. And this has the, this class of drug first approved in 2015 um, have really changed the landscape and improve the quality of life and survival for our patients. So um, the study confirmed that for the hormone positive, so dark blue and light blue, patients really have significantly better survival compared to um, the triple negatives. Again, this is breaking down by um, luminal A or B, and these are the hormone-positive breast cancers. <coughs> Next, I'd like to give an update on the RESPONDER trial, and this is a really important study that utilized the Oncotype DX score and use it to find out if a patient population that have low genomic risk can safely omit chemotherapy, even if they had one to three positive lymph nodes. And so this study was reported about a year and a half ago, and these are the updated um, survival data. So this, this study showed that for the postmenopausal patients, um, no chemotherapy benefit was seen in the invasive disease-free survival or relapse-free survival. This is the um, study schema for this trial. So patients with a Oncotype DX recurrence score zero to 25, were randomized to standard of care chemotherapy or hormonal therapy alone. And in the postmenopausal population, we can see that the survival curves almost superimpose on each other. And so there's no difference between patients who receive chemotherapy versus those who did not if they are postmenopausal. And this is extremely important because it's really enabled us to utilize this genomic test, test the Oncotype DX, to identify which patients can safely omit chemotherapy. But in the premenopausal patient population, there seems to be a sustained 5% um, benefit from chemotherapy. It's also, the study was not powered to really tell whether the ovarian function suppression can replace chemotherapy. So um, really another study has to be designed to address this question. 
So next, an ongoing study that I want to talk about is for patients with slightly larger tumor and any node and any node um, status with, um, with with their breast cancer that's ER positive. Patients that are strongly ER positive and respond to a preoperative trial of hormonal therapy are selected to go to surgery after um, six months of hormonal therapy. If they didn't respond at week four or 12, then they actually come off and receive chemotherapy. So this is going to be a trial that's going to change also our strategy in the patient's population who with larger tumors and more nodal involvement. Now, when we talk about lowering long-term risk of recurrence, um, one of the strategies we have is extending the um, amount of time we ask patients to stay on these endocrine therapies. But um, the benefit is not completely clear. Some, there are some studies that show benefit, especially in patients who started off with tamoxifen, but there hasn't been strong overall survival benefit. So. I want to talk about studies that used other approaches. Um, the first study I want to talk about is actually using metformin. And metformin may sound familiar because it is, it is a drug that is used for patients with diabetes, non-insulin um, dependent diabetes mostly. It does cause weight loss. And in, in um, preoperative studies, there, it's been shown to reduce the proliferation index or the KI-67 in breast cancer cells and in other preclinical studies can slow the growth of breast cancer. So this is a study that in early stage breast cancer patients who are hormone positive or hormone negative, they did study the specifically the hormone positive group um, as a stratification. And they randomized these patients to take metformin or not. And this is the survival curve for the estrogen receptor positive patients. And although it looks like there is one curve, it's actually two. So unfortunately, metformin did not show that it was effective. And even though we were disappointed, I think it is important to look at um, studies that are negative too, because the recommendation now as a conclusion from the study is that metformin should not be used as a breast cancer treatment in this patient population. But we know that lifestyle modifications, um, instead of pharmacologic uh, modifications alone, can actually contribute to lowering risk of recurrence. So next, I'm going to talk in the next um, in the last couple of minutes about hyperadiposity and inflammatory microenvironment. Um, what does this all mean? So when we talk about um, adipocyte, these are fat cells, and in in patients who do have extra fat cells, there, there are not only extra numbers of fat cells, but also they are larger than usual. And what happens is that um, under, the, under the microscope, our pathologists are able to see these crown-like um, figures. And these structures actually can cause inflammation and cause stimulation in the breast tissue um, going back to make the breast tissue more susceptible to developing breast tumors. Um, and one of the mechanism also is that it increases the bioavailability of estrogen leading to um, increase in estradiol. So how can we modify this? Exercise is actually associated with reduction in the adipose inflammation. So whether a patient in a full range of um, body mass index or normal body mass index, those in red are those patients who um, you, who exercise regularly and regularly, meaning aerobic exercise about 150 minutes a week, and they have significantly reduced inflammation. And so our perhaps our risk reduction approach um, cannot be one single thing that we do. And so this is the World Cancer Research Fund and American Institute for Cancer Research recommendation for risk, risk reduction for cancer. And it involves um, being at a healthy weight, being physically active, eating a diet that's rich in vegetables, low in processed meat and red meat, um, cutting down sugars and alcohol consumption. For, um, for young women, actually, the breast cancer um, prevention can start early. If for, for mothers, you can choose to breastfeed your 
baby. And if you can do that for six months or more for each child that you have, it significantly reduces your risk of developing breast cancer. And lastly, there is this um, structured exercise plus plant-based diet um, trial that is being developed and, and, and I think actively accruing now. And so there are all a lot of different approaches to reducing a patient's risk of recurrence. And again, maintaining an optimal body fat and lean mass, lean, uh, mass ratio for overweight or obese patients, we actually recommend not losing a lot of weight very quickly, but slow and steady so that the weight loss is maintained. So about one to one and a half pounds per week. And this is really important to emphasize as, as we are, you know, um, always addressing this issue with our patient that it is not the how fast you lose it, but how steadily you lose it and to keep the weight off to re, as a means to reduce your risk for recurrence. And so with that, um, it concludes my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. All right, up next, I would like to introduce our breast cancer surgeon, Dr. Freya Schnabel. Hi, good evening. Hold on one second and we will start the talk. Thank you everybody for your attention and for uh, attending this and certainly thank you to the organizers for including me. So um, I'm going to be presenting some updates from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. And as I usually do, um, I'm going to present information about a, a big variety of different topics. Some of this is going to overlap a little bit, but um, most of this is going to be unique to this presentation. So as I usually do, I'd like to start out by talking about genetic predisposition and breast cancer risk assessment. Most of you who have uh, heard me speak at these seminars in the past know that that's a particular area of interest of mine. So um, I'm going to just give you a little information that was presented in one of the name talks by Dr. Judy Garber, who is a breast cancer physician at the Dana-Farber and who has had a very long history of interest in breast cancer and other cancer genetics. And this was a, an award lecture that she delivered, which allowed her to really be thoughtful about how uh, breast cancer genetic testing has evolved over time. And I just want to share with you a couple of these slides because today in 2022, the indications for recommending genetic testing to women who are affected with breast cancer are very much expanded from what they were even five or 10 years ago. So for now, we recommend genetic testing for patients with breast cancer if they're uh, less than or, or, or at age 45, or if they're under age 50 with limited knowledge of their family history and or relatives with pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer. Any woman who is below the age of 60 with triple negative breast cancer is also recommended to undergo genetic testing. And it's important to note that genetic testing recommendations are no longer limited to considerations about family history. We also recommend genetic testing for women with breast cancer who are uh, of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage because we know that the frequency of having BRCA mutations is elevated in that group of individuals. Women with bilateral breast cancer if the first diagnosis was before age 50. Male, males with breast cancer or with family history of male breast cancer. Individuals with a personal or family history of ovarian cancer pancreatic cancer or metastatic prostate cancer. In addition, if an affected individual has a relative who was diagnosed with breast cancer before age 50 or at least two members of the family diagnosed at any age, we recommend genetic testing. Certainly, if a patient has a newly diagnosed breast cancer and knows that there is a genetic uh, breast cancer susceptibility gene in the family, that's someone that we would recommend testing to. In addition, and, and some of the participants on the call tonight will recognize this, many of our patients underwent cancer genetic testing years and years ago, when the testing was done in a very limited fashion, sometimes only testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And today, many of those patients are cycling back into expanded testing, looking at a variety, excuse me, a variety of additional genes that have now been related to susceptibility for breast and other cancers. Once again, 
the thinking about genetic testing has now expanded to include individuals for whom the results of the testing may actually affect their treatment. So not just understanding why they got breast cancer, but helping us to refine their treatment by using specific drugs that may only be effective in women with BRCA mutations like the PARP inhibitors. So this is really a sea change in terms of our thinking about genetic testing. And as I, I say frequently in my office, the threshold for recommending genetic testing to women with breast cancer seems to go down pretty much every day. Um, so we now include patients not only with family history of breast cancer, but family history of an expanded list of additional cancers. We now recommend testing based on certain ethnicities and also tumor subtype. Um, there may come a day when all women with newly diagnosed breast cancers are recommended to do genetic testing, I kind of think that day is not very far off. Now, Dr. Garber has also been involved in breast cancer prevention uh, over the years, and she is actually the principal investigator of a study looking at the use of uh, donosumab, which is a drug that's mainly used for bone health, in the prevention of breast cancer in postmenopausal women who are BRCA1 carriers. And this is an international study um, that has just launched. She also pointed out to us that there are multiple studies now looking at prevention or risk reduction for ovarian cancer in BRCA carriers specifically directed at understanding if removing the fallopian tubes uh, by themselves as compared with removing the ovaries and the tubes may afford the, uh, a reduction in the risk of ovarian cancer in BRCA carriers. This is really important work. And I think of tremendous interest, especially the young women uh, who have these mutations. Now, I wanna also share just a little bit of information um, from a terrific talk that was once again, uh, a, a lecture delivered by someone who is being honored by this opportunity uh, by Dr. Fume Olapade, who is um, uh, the Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor at the Center of Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health at the University of Chicago. And Dr. Olapade is really just an absolute uh, giant in this field who has had a storied and really wonderful, um, rewarding career in the field. I'm not gonna tell you her whole story, the, this lecture, and you could, you could uh, see it online, was absolutely unbelievable. But I wanna show you one important, uh, one important thing that she brought out in her lecture. And that is that there are significantly higher rates of uh, pathogenic variants in the genes that predispose women to breast cancer among black women across the African diaspora. So if you look at this table, I think what you can clearly see is that when we're looking at women of Nigerian, Cameroonian, Ugandan, and Brazilian heritage um, who, are, who undergo genetic testing, and here we're kind of looking at these figures highlighted in red, they have a significantly higher rate of being identified with some of these breast cancer related genes like BRCA1 and 2 and PALB2 versus women who are African American or who have been enrolled in large studies that were directed by the genetic testing companies. So this is super important to us. It means we need to learn more about the genetic patterns in uh, diverse populations to better understand their patterns of disease and ultimately to refine their treatment. So really interesting information here. Now, moving on to breast cancer prevention. So um, some of this is uh, a little bit as an overlap from Dr. Chan's uh, discussion a few minutes ago. And I'm gonna share with you some information that was presented about fine tuning risk assessment and risk reduction, focusing on exercise and diet. And this was a, a terrific talk delivered by Dr. Iyengar from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. So it's long been recognized that uh, obesity increases the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. So that's not news to anyone. But in refining our understanding about the relationship of obesity and postmenopausal breast cancer, what this slide demonstrates is the relationship of body fat to the risk for breast cancer. And you can see as uh, patients go up in terms of whole body and trunk fat mass, especially trunk fat mass, the risk of breast cancer goes up significantly. So why is that? 
So historically, this was thought to be because there was production of estrogen in uh, fat cells. And we know that that's true. Adrenal glands and fat cells also make some estrogen. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, the suggestion was made that the issue was actually about inflammation. So um, the, this term of hyperadiposity was coined to describe a, a situation where the fat tissue, which is normally present within the breast and other parts of the body, actually has these crown-like structures around it, as Dr. Chan mentioned, and this is associated with inflammation within the breast tissue and a pro-estrogen microenvironment that potentially could facilitate tumor growth. So it's not the fat itself, it's this uh, issue with the microenvironment. They looked at this adipose inflammation in women with benign breast disease and were able to identify that inflammation in the fatty tissue increased their breast cancer risk. But really interesting, while the rate is uh, higher in overweight and obese women, about one third of women with normal body mass index also have adipose inflammation in the fatty tissue in their breasts. Very interesting. And normal weight women who have this inflammation in fatty tissue of their breasts have higher rates, uh, higher levels of aromatase, which is an enzyme that's important in the synthesis of estrogen. So what they've done actually is to provide the links in terms of the mechanism relating uh, body fat to um, breast cancer risk. This was, uh, um, I think, a really important picture that shows that the BMI, the body mass index, can be the same, but the distribution and percentage of body fat can be different. And as Dr. Chan alluded to, exercise is associated with reduced adipose inflammation and a reduction in breast cancer risk regardless of BMI. So just to give you the current recommendations, and I'm, I'm not gonna talk about the dietary recommendations because I'll tell you the truth, I think they are so specific that they're really hard to think about. So we'd like people to uh, maintain optimal body fat and lean mass ratio. Safe rate of weight loss looks like about one to one and a half pounds per week. We encourage healthy eating patterns rather than specific diets until there's further information and particularly increasing physical activity, um, even uh, for women who have a non-optimal body mass index, physical activity increases general health, not just uh, cancer risk reduction. And so this is something important for us to recommend to our patients because this is modifiable uh, risk factors. Another interesting talk in the same vein about prevention was delivered by Brandy Heckman Stoddard from the National Cancer Institute, who is the chief of the Breast and Gynecologic Cancer Research Group in the Division of Cancer Prevention. And what Dr. Stoddard did is she reviewed a little bit about what is now the present uh, state of the art in prevention trials and what is the future going to look like. So as Dr. Chan alluded to, the idea of looking at metformin as a drug that could prevent cancer in women who have uh, cytologic atypia, which is a condition in the breast that increases risk, very interesting. There's an aspirin trial looking to see if taking aspirin can reduce breast density as seen on mammography, potentially maybe a surrogate for risk reduction. And of course, Dr. Garber's uh, study of denosumab in reducing breast cancer risk for women with BRCA1 mutation. So this is kind of the current state of the art. Now, we all recognize that breast cancer prevention has been kind of stalled for a very long time and has up till now focused really on hormonal agents, tamoxifen, raloxifene, aromatase inhibitors. And clearly there's more that we can do in expanding our range for breast cancer prevention. Nutraceuticals, um, great idea, maybe suggested by epidemiological associations, but because these um, supplements typically are not standardized, it's hard to understand how well they work, and we can't assume that just because something is considered, quote, natural, that it's not toxic. There were studies a number of years ago looking at some anti-inflammatory agents like celecoxib and sulindac. The sulindac study showed a reduction in breast density, but the celecoxib study was terminated early because of concerns about cardiac risk with the drug. Vaccine studies have been very limited to date. There are a lot of new agents that are potentially in early phase uh, consideration, 
But in order to help us assess breast cancer prevention and how well any of these drugs work, we need good risk assessment models to help us define different levels of risk and different study populations to help us um, design our studies appropriately. And also looking at breast cancer risk and risk reduction would necessitate very, very long-term studies looking at women for 15 years or 20 years down the road. So because that's not so feasible, we have to figure out what else we can do, what biomarkers we can look at in the tissue or the blood to help us understand if the agents that are being considered are actually working. So there's a lot that needs to be done in the field, but it's encouraging to know that we are expanding um, this topic. Now, going on to surgical treatment, I'm gonna take the liberty of showing you some data that was presented from our own medical center, from my own service, looking at um, lumpectomy surgery for intraductal carcinoma, DCIS, which is stage zero breast cancer. This is, believe it or not, a kind of challenging area for surgery, despite the early nature of, uh, of these lesions. Uh, they're most of the time not palpable, and it can be really difficult to tell the extent of disease and uh, to create an environment where we can be successful with lumpectomies at a one-stage procedure. We know that when we do lumpectomies, we need to get a negative margin around the disease to reduce the risk for recurrence in the breast. So we looked at our own data for women who had pure DCIS, no invasive cancer, from 2010 to 2021. We looked at how well we did in terms of being able to accomplish a one-stage lumpectomy. And then we also looked at how this practice changed over time, particularly focusing on um, innovations in surgical technique, including the use of the margin probe device for intraoperative margin assessment. And this is what the data looked like. We started out with about 692 uh, patients within this group. We split them up into 2010 to 2014, and then 2014 um, to 2021. And we looked at our rates of uh, one-stage lumpectomy, that would be the no re-excision groups, and then re-excision um, groups in both cohorts. So what you can see from this diagram is that prior to 2014, about 42% of patients who underwent lumpectomies for this very early stage of disease needed a second operation to clear the margins compared with 24% after 2014. This was a significant difference. Not surprisingly, a larger size of DCIS was associated with a higher need for second surgeries. And in addition, a specific subtype called papillary DCIS also was associated with higher re-excision rates. Now, when we looked carefully at our data, what we were able to see is that when we did use this margin probe device to assess the lumpectomy margins in the operating room, patients who used the margin probe were much less likely to need a re-excision. And this was very, very significant statistically. When we looked at this data in a careful way, controlling for the age of the patients, the size of their disease, menopausal status, breast density, et cetera, the margin probe was still an important factor in reducing the need for re-excisions. So it supports the idea of continuing to use this device as a way to help us uh, improve the surgical results for patients with DCIS. Now, a couple of other interesting things came out of this assessment. For patients who didn't have a successful first lumpectomy operation, about 20% of them said, we're not gonna continue with breast conserving surgery and we're gonna convert to doing a mastectomy. So that's a little bit concerning to us because we always try to uh, encourage breast conserving surgery and increase the likelihood of success with that technique. Now, to be fair about it, of those 20%, 45 patients, um, six of those patients had undergone genetic testing, discovered a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, and then perhaps appropriately went on to mastectomy. So it wasn't always just about re-excisions, but anything that lowers the rate of re-excisions and increases the success with one-stage lumpectomy, I think, supports the practice of breast conserving surgery, um, and that's really important to us. Now, moving on, this was a really interesting presentation that came from Case Western Reserve uh, in Cleveland, looking at uh, sentinel node biopsies in women over 70 with early stage disease. There's been some um, discussion around whether or not it's necessary in those patients to include removal of the first few 
lymph nodes at the time of their breast cancer surgery. So these researchers looked at the National Cancer Database, large database, including data from 1500 uh, institutions around the country, looking at women over age 70 with early stage cancer in one breast that was hormone sensitive and HER2 new negative, so biologically favorable profile, who underwent breast conserving surgery and also received hormonal therapy. And they excluded patients who had more extensive nodal disease or who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So of over 14,000 patients, almost 14% of them had only had lumpectomies and did not have any lymph nodes removed as part of their surgery. Now, um, of these patients who did go on to do sentinel node procedures, uh, they found that of the patients who had any disease in the sentinel nodes, the majority of them did go on to receive additional treatment with radiation and chemotherapy, and that central location of the tumor, slightly larger tumor size, and also evidence of invasion of the lymphatics within the breast tissue with tumor cells were associated with seeing that the disease had extended to those lymph nodes. Now, not surprisingly, the patients who did not have any lymph nodes removed were much less likely to get some of these adjunctive therapies like chemotherapy and radiation. And as a result, potentially, omitting removal of the lymph nodes was associated with a worse overall survival. So these two statements are linked. Chemotherapy and radiation were more done in women who had sentinel nodes removed. They were associated with better survival and omitting lymph node removal and potentially depriving patients of the opportunity for additional therapy was associated with a worse survival. So this data really uh, supports the idea of continuing to include sentinel node assessment even in older women with uh, relatively early stage disease. There was a wonderful uh, discussion around how to refine uh, the management of the axillary lymph nodes for patients with more extensive disease, those who undergo neoadjuvant or pre-surgical chemotherapy. So we understand that as the years have gone on, we have been refining the approach to surgery in the axilla with removal of only uh, sentinel nodes, mapping out those first few lymph nodes and removing sentinel nodes now has become the routine for people with early stage breast cancer who don't appear to have any obvious disease in the lymph nodes. Um, and many patients who have on the other side of the spectrum more extensive breast cancer or the higher risk subtypes such as the triple negative and HER2 new positive patients undergo neoadjuvant systemic therapy before their surgery. Now, we have to try to work on refining how we view those patients in terms of their ultimate surgery and how we manage the uh, assessment of the axillary lymph nodes. So in order to determine better what the extent of surgery should be after treatment, we have to look at the patients before they start treatment and really understand and be very uh, careful about localizing and biopsying any positive lymph nodes that we understand the extent of their disease before they start treatment. For patients who start treatment with no evidence of disease in the lymph nodes, when they come to their surgery after the neoadjuvant therapy, it's appropriate for us to do that very refined management with lymphatic mapping and simply removing those first few lymph nodes, the so-called sentinel node biopsy or dissection, because it's an accurate way to look at the lymph nodes um, and allows us to prevent uh, removing additional uninvolved lymph nodes in that group. However, for patients who have had a clearly documented disease in the axillary lymph nodes prior to beginning chemotherapy, this technique does not seem to be accurate and it has a high false negative rate, meaning that just by trying to map out the first few lymph nodes and taking them out, you can miss um, positive lymph nodes within the axillary area and not remove them and not know that they're there. Now, this is something that we've tried to work on to try to refine our ability to remove fewer lymph nodes, but yet get accurate information after neoadjuvant therapy. So, the way that that technique is refined is that beside using dyes to map out the first few lymph nodes as we do in all the sentinel node procedures, whether for early or later stage disease, 
We try to do the mapping with two tracers with a colored blue dye and a radioisotope. And if we remove at least three lymph nodes, the accuracy is increased. In addition, if we take care to localize and target any lymph nodes that had been biopsied and we know contain some disease and remove them at the time of the lymph node surgery, then again, we really improve the accuracy of this technique, but still are reducing the overall number of lymph nodes to be removed. Having said all of this, in women who have neoadjuvant therapy and have residual disease remaining within the lymph nodes, um, at that point, we do need to do a complete axillary node dissection and clear the lymph nodes in the specific level one and level two area under the arm. So this is an area that's in evolution, um, but requires a lot of care in understanding the extent of disease preoperatively um, in order to refine the surgery. Now, I, I also would like to spend a couple of minutes just running through this uh, really important and interesting study of the uh, impact of race and ethnicity on lymphedema after axillary node dissection. So this has to do with patients who have not the, uh, the limited and targeted dissection, but women for whom the lymph nodes in the group under the arm are, uh, have been removed. So this is a study from Memorial Sloan Kettering where they enrolled patients from November 2016 to March 2020. Um, they included patients who had one uh, unilateral, just one side axillary node dissection. They um, excluded patients who had had prior surgery in the area, and then they evaluated patients at the baseline, post-op, and every six months for two years. Um, the group of patients that were evaluated was 276 total. What they did was to look at the race and ethnicity of the patients to try to use this um, as a way of distinguishing if race or ethnicity were a factor in lymphedema. And what they found is number one, that the cumulative in incidence of lymphedema was about 8.8% at 12 months, but went up to almost 25% um, when the patients were two years after their surgery. So that, that's a pretty high rate. They clearly identified the fact that for black and Hispanic individuals, the risk of lymphedema was substantially higher than for uh, other groups, uh, including uh, Caucasian and Asian individuals. Also interesting, patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that's the treatment prior to surgery, had a higher rate of lymphedema at that two-year mark. So for patients who had upfront surgery, the rate didn't change that much from one to two years, but it went up significantly in patients who had neoadjuvant therapy. Factors that seemed to increase the risk of lymphedema were age, BMI, so higher BMI had a higher risk, Clearly there was an impact of race and ethnicity, and clearly there was an impact in terms of number of lymph nodes removed and number of lymph nodes that contained breast cancer. Um, when they uh, looked at this more carefully, neoadjuvant therapy also increased the risk of lymphedema, and there was an effect of time and of uh, subtype. Interesting uh, change in body mass index, arm dominance, and a variety of other factors, including nodal radiation, did not appear to be associated with the development of lymphedema. And the predictors of lymphedema were um, non-Caucasian race, Black and Hispanic individuals, uh, neoadjuvant therapy, age, and of course, time were very much associated. So their conclusions were that there was a higher incidence of lymphedema in Black women treated with axillary node dissection radiation after adjustment for other variables, neoadjuvant chemotherapy significantly increased the risk of lymphedema compared to women who had their uh, systemic therapy after surgery. And a possible mechanism is that the neoadjuvant chemotherapy may cause fibrosis of the lymphatics uh, prior to surgery, resulting in higher rates of lymphedema. The uh, association with neoadjuvant therapy is a little bit troubling and may suggest that for women who are unlikely to respond to neoadjuvant therapy, we should perhaps de-escalate that to lower their risk of lymphedema, but a lot of additional study here is certainly uh, in need. So to summarize, the indications for genetic testing for patients with new breast cancer um, are expanding, and we're learning more about the genetics in diverse populations. Hyperadiposity and adipose inflammation 
Both appear to elevate breast cancer risk and lifestyle factors are an opportunity to modify breast cancer risk. There's a lot of interest in non-hormonal uh, agents for breast cancer prevention. Breast conserving surgery can be supported by new technology that increases the success rate of primary lumpectomy procedures. Sentinel node biopsies are important to help us plan therapy even for women with early stage disease. We need to carefully understand the extent of disease in the axillary lymph nodes for patients who are going to have neoadjuvant systemic therapy to help us refine their surgery after therapy. Complete axillary node dissection is not always needed for patients who have lymph node involvement and undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy with good response to treatment. And black women are more at risk for lymphedema after axillary node dissection and radiation. We need to look at that uh, topic much more carefully to uncover the mechanism that's responsible for this observation. So thank you everybody for your attention um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions uh, at the end. Thank you, Dr. Schnabel. That was great. Uh, you, I know you've been speaking at this lecture for us for many, many years, and we always look forward to hearing your updates. So thank you. Thanks. All right. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our final speaker tonight, Dr. Namit Gerber, who is going to talk about the updates in radiation. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, can everyone see my slides and hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to touch on three topics that all came up at San Antonio. Uh, we're going to talk about a new study looking at the omission of radiation uh, in a select group of women who underwent breast conservant surgery. Uh, we're going to look at an abstract that was presented um, on repeat radiation in women who have had a repeat lumpectomy for a recurrence. And then we'll briefly touch on some of the newer data about the role of radiation in patients with oligometastases, meaning patients who do not have uh, a lot of metastases. These are my disclosures. Okay, so we'll start with this abstract that looked at the omission of radiation. So just as a you know, word of background, uh, we currently have um, some very good published data that shows that in women over the age of 70 uh, in the CALGB trial and in, in a similar trial called the PRIME2 trial, women over 65 who have stage one disease that's hormone receptor positive, um, this, is a, this is a study that randomized women to tamoxifen alone versus tamoxifen with radiation. And what you can see um, up here on the upper right uh, is that the curves do separate. So the patients who get tamoxifen and radiation do better. They have a higher recurrence-free survival, so fewer recurrences than the patients who get tamoxifen. But there's ultimately no difference in mastectomy-free survival and also in overall survival, which is another curve that I didn't show from the paper. Um, and therefore, in this patient population, women over 70 with early stage estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, there is potentially a role for not doing radiation, of course, uh, with the discussion of the risks and benefits uh, with, with, with our patients. Now, one thing just to point out in this study is that um, this is still in the era of axillary lymph node dissection. Um, and you can see in this paper, about two thirds of the women did not have an axillary dissection. And, uh, and this is important because this comes up all the time now if we have a patient who does not undergo a central lymph node biopsy because of age or because of other medical conditions, uh, they would still have been represented in this trial, and therefore, I think you know you can still talk about not potentially not doing radiation um, if they're going to take tamoxifen. Now, as our knowledge of the biology of breast cancer has expanded, we've been able to refine our criteria for who doesn't need radiation even further. So this is looking at tumor subtype as a selection criteria for who doesn't need radiation. Um, using uh, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor for two and gray to approximate the biological subtypes of luminal A, luminal B, luminal HER2, HER2, and triple negative. And you can see up here in this upper right uh, graph that the luminal A patients have the lowest rate of uh, recurrence. In the gray is the HER2 positive patients, but an important note, this was before the era of trastuzumab of Herceptin. So nowadays the HER2 rates are much lower than they were in this study. And you could see the triple negatives over here in the light blue. 
um, even more than tumor subtype, we can actually use uh, our multi-gene scores like Oncotype and PAM50, not just to predict for distant recurrence, which is how we use them when we're talking about systemic therapy, but also for local regional recurrence. Uh, on the right here, you can see um, that Oncotype separates patients out in terms of their risk of recurrence based on their recurrence score. Similarly, the PAM50 uh, assay divides patients into low risk and high risk, and this predicts for local regional recurrence. So this data is um, hypothesis generating for maybe we should, we should and we can be using our genomic scores to help us figure out who doesn't need radiation. And it's into this context that we got this study at San Antonio, uh, which was a multi-hospital retrospective review uh, of patients who meet this ongoing Lumina trial criteria. And Lumina trial includes patients 55 or older with unifocal disease, T1 and 0, grade 1 to 2, and then they use ER and PR have to be positive for two negative and KI67 less than 13% without lymphovascular invasion and no grade three. And they, they compared patients who got radiation to those who did not get radiation. And importantly, they actually looked at the adherence to endocrine therapy, uh, which is of course connected to our outcomes in this patient population. And they defined adherence as completed five years of endocrine therapy or discontinued due to disease recurrence or death. Um, and you can see these curves uh, do diverge with the radiation patients doing better than those who don't get radiation, similar to the, the, the studies I already showed you in older women. Um, but interestingly, among the patients who were endocrine adherent, the rates were equivalent, 100% and 100%. And in those who were non-adherent, you can see 100% in the radiation arm versus 83% in the endocrine therapy alone arm, though this was not statistically significant. Now, of course, this was not a randomized study. So these groups are not perfectly balanced. The patients who did not get radiation tended to be older and also tended to have higher rates of non adherence to endocrine therapy. Um, and this study really sets the stage for these ongoing prospective trials, which are summarized in this table thanks to Dr. Bradley's discussion of this trial at San Antonio. And I appreciate uh, her letting me use her slide. Um, and these are all ongoing studies that are trying to select patients younger than age 70 for whom we already have good data, um, but in whom they might not need radiation because of their biology. So the Lumina trial we already discussed, the IDEA trial uses the Oncotype recurrence score less than 18, uh, the Precision trial uses PAM50, the EXPERT trial also looks at use the PAM50, and the Prime Time is a UK observational cohort study that used IHC4 based on ERPR grade and KI67. Uh, we also at NYU just are about to open the DEBRA trial, which is another trial looking at um, omission in carefully selected patients, women ages 50 to 70 with an oncotype less than 18, ER and or PR positive for two negative. They have to be uh, pathological T1 node negative, unifocal invasive histology, no tumor on ink, and they'll be randomized to breast radiation and endocrine therapy or just endocrine therapy, no breast radiation. And all of these patients must have undergone axillary staging. So we look forward to opening this trial and enrolling on it and really contributing to this very exciting area of research for who does not need radiation, even in a younger age group. Now, you know, it's very important to point out that we're talking about de-escalation of radiation. It's not all or nothing, right? All of the trials I just showed you omitted radiation. They left it out. Uh, but we can de-escalate radiation and still give it. And, and this was actually a topic of a debate at San Antonio. And the title of the debate was one week of whole breast radiation is the new standard of care. There was a pro and a con. And Dr. Coles from the UK argued the pro. Uh, and, and these are some of her slides. Uh, so she is one of the uh, principal investigators of this UK fast forward study, which was a trial out of England. It was published about a year and a half ago where they randomized patients to get our, our standard 40 grain, 15 fractions, three weeks of radiation, first two regimens that are only one week of radiation to the whole breast. And they had excellent clinical assessments for 10 years, photos, patient reported outcomes with the primary endpoint being its lateral breast tumor recurrence. And these are the curves. And I, you know, it's very important to point out this Y axis here is incredibly zoomed in. This is 1%, 2%, 3%, and then goes up to 100%. So these curves are actually completely superimposed. Uh, if you can imagine if we were to zoom out to the 100%, these curves, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between them. There was no difference in its lateral breast tumor recurrence. There was also no difference in normal tissue effects up to five years between the lower of the five fraction arm uh, and the 40 gray, the 15 fractions, the, the three weeks that's our traditional uh, treatment. And so the conclusion of Dr. Coles and from the study is that 
um, we should be moving even in the whole breast situation towards this five fraction regimen of just one week of radiation. And certainly something we've started giving at NYU and in the appropriate patients, and this is very exciting research. Uh, in addition, when we're, treat when we're de escalating treatment, uh, there's also partial breast radiation, which we give a lot of at NYU. And this is both accelerating the treatment to one week and also reducing the field size. Uh, we recently finished um, a phase three trial comparing three treatments to five treatments of partial breast radiation. And what you can see from this screenshot over here is when we're just treating part of the breast, we're able to move the back edge of our beam uh, all the way to just where the tumor bed is and stay even further away from the heart and the lungs. And that's a real advantage of partial breast that really allows us to de-escalate the size of our field and the dose to the normal organ. Okay, so now shifting gears to another abstract from San Antonio that was looking at repeat breast conserving surgery and re irradiation. As many of you know, historically, if a woman got a lumpectomy and radiation and then had a recurrence in that breast, her only surgical option was a mastectomy. Now, thankfully, we have emerging data that in certain patients, it is appropriate to repeat the lumpectomy and repeat radiation. So this is um, published data from the Jack Estro group uh, where they did a uh, propensity score matched analysis of patients with a recurrence in the breast. In blue are the salvage mastectomy patients, and in red are patients who got a second uh, lumpectomy followed by um, IORT, which is giving the radiation intraoperatively. Uh, it was, I'm sorry, it was brachytherapy, which is, uh, which is um, also giving radiation with catheters. Um, and you can see there was no difference um, in the incidence of a third ipsilateral breast tumor event or of a regional relapse. Um, and similarly, no difference in distant metastases or in disease-free survival. Um, we also had from, from the US, the RTOG 1014 trial, which was published um, a little over a year ago. And this was using external beam radiation uh, in patients who had a burn after a lumpectomy. And, and this regimen was giving radiation twice a day for three weeks. Um, and they showed excellent outcomes with the rates of a third recurrence, uh, single digits, uh, 5%, and then the risk of high of grade three toxicity, also low single digits. Um, and this trial really sort of, um, in a, it was multi-institutional with perspective um, and, and provided really good evidence uh, for the possibility in, in 58 study patients. Uh, so, you know, a, a pretty good sample size for this setting. Um, of the uh, feasibility of repeat lumpectomy and radiation. And then just um, at San Antonio um, last month, we had the presentation of PD709, which is um, a multi-institutional retrospective review from, from Spain. Uh, all patients who had prior lumpectomy and radiation, 35 patients, median age of 65, some invasive recurrences, some DCIS recurrences. Um, all subtypes were represented, and here's the breakdown. And they only included patients who had an isolated recurrence in the breast. If they had concurrent distant metastases, they were excluded. They had to be older than age 50, more than four years from their primary treatment, less than two centimeters, and no significant major radiation toxicity from their first course of radiation. All patients were treated with a second lumpectomy, um, accelerated partial breast re irradiation. Uh, the median follow up was three years. They had four relapses, but only one in the uh, same breast. So there was. Um, a, a third recurrence in the breast rate of less than 3%. And they had three metastatic recurrences. And you can see that their regional free survival, metastasis free survival, and overall survival were excellent with a five-year overall survival of 93.3% with two deaths unrelated to breast cancer. And this is comparing, again, Dr. Bradley's discussion of this abstract of San Antonio, this abstract to the 1014 trial. The 1014 trial was larger. Um, uh, the, the inclusion criteria were very similar. The uh, tumor recurrence had to be less than 2 cm here, less than 3 cm here. Uh, there was a higher proportion of DCIS recurrences in 1014. Uh, the dose and fractionation was different. Um, I told you about 1014. In, in this abstract, they actually used hypofractionation. They used three weeks of radiation in their external beam patients, which is, as far as I'm aware, the first data of that fractionation in a recurrent setting, which is really valuable data. Um, and their median follow-up was longer in 1014, but very low rates of a second in breast tumor recurrence, 3% versus 5%, and very excellent overall survival rate. Um, and these are the recommendations from Italy for when we would do a second breast uh, conservation approach, age greater than 50, 
small cancer, a late recurrence, absence of multifocality or multicentricity on imaging, desire of the patient for the conservative approach, approach and acceptable cosmetic results. Similarly, from Germany, there are guidelines as to whom might be appropriate for a second breast conservation approach and its patients with an isolated if lateral breast tumor recurrence, limited size, unifocal on imaging, older than age 50, a long interval between the primary treatment and recurrence, patient preference for second breast conservation, and that it's technically feasible and will result in acceptable cosmetic results. Okay, and, and, and so just to conclude that section, this is data that, that's really adding to our data uh, for you know, repeat breast conserving surgery and radiation, and is actually adding a novel piece about the kind of fractionation we can use for this radiation. So this is incredibly exciting data out of San Antonio. Um, and then finally, just to discuss the role of radiation in metastatic disease, and this, is, uh, this was a clinical forum session at San Antonio called The Promise and Reality of oligometastatic ablation for breast cancer, uh, given by Dr. David Palma. Um, and Dr. Palma points out, you know, we now have multiple randomized trials on the benefit of giving ablative radiation, so high-dose radiation, to patients with metastases with a limited number of metastases and metastatic disease. Uh, the one that's most relevant to breast cancer patients is the published Saber Comet data. Uh, in this trial, patients with multiple histologies, including breast cancer, you can see up here from the paper, the breast cancer patients were 15% in the control arm and 20% in the saber arm. Patients were randomized to the control arm, which is essentially just continuing whatever chemo or endocrine therapy they are recommended based on their breast cancer, uh, or saber, which is giving high-dose radiation to the metastatic site. And you can see the significant difference in survival favoring the saber arm, 42.3% versus 17.7%. And the median overall survival was 50 months in the saber arm and 28 months in the control arm. Uh, right now, we are now have the saber comet 3 trial, which is a randomized phase 3 trial looking at the same question, standard of care systemic therapy versus saber, and we look forward to those results. Um, there are two breast-specific trials looking at the role of high-dose radiation in oligometastatic patients. There's NRGBR002, uh, which is currently on hold. Uh, the phase two portion is completed, and we're awaiting the phase two analysis before moving on to the phase three trial. And then there's a trial from the Gustav Rusi looking at um, 280 patients with breast cancer and oligometastasis. And, and these trials will really help us better understand what the role is of oligometastases, of, of high-dose radiation for patients with oligometastases and breast cancer. Um, so with that, I um, just wanna thank everyone for listening, especially since I'm the last speaker of the night, really appreciate your attention. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak tonight. Thank you, Dr. Gerber. All right, uh, that was the last presentation. It is a little bit after seven, so we don't have much time for questions and some of them were already addressed, but I do have a few here that I wanted to throw out there to the speakers. Um, the first one here, can you define triple negative breast cancer and is there a breast cancer trial for triple negative breast cancer? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, I think uh, Sylvia's not here today, but you know, in, in the cancer center, I think the definition, uh, you know, first of all, we do have trials, it depends on, you know, what stage of triple negative breast cancer, uh, but triple negative conventionally is defined as being negative for the, you know, um, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 receptor. And that's based on our routine pathological uh, stains, uh, the immunohistochemical staging. So that's what most, um, that's what the definition really is. There are some patients who have ER negative um, and PR positive and HER2 negative cancers, but sometimes fall in that category because we know that these cancers are not strongly estrogen driven. Now the definition of ER positive and PR positive is typically cancers that are more than 1% positive. However, we know that there are some, uh, there's some gray zone there. For example, women with low ER positive, which is under 10% or low PR positive, uh, very often behave more aggressively like triple negative cancers. Uh, so yes, we do have trials and it really depends on you know, what stage and you know, what, we're, uh, what the question is that we're answering. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have one here. 
had a double mastectomy 10 years ago when diagnosed with BRCA1, what kind of follow-up is appropriate? So I think this is also a question um, from a patient who also had double mastectomy and also surgery for ovarian cancer. Is that correct? Um, let's see. It looks like it. Yes. Right, right, right. Um, so the, the, the follow-up actually depends firstly on the um, frequency follow-up needed for um, her gynecologic um, cancer that was treated. So she was treated, I, I believe, five years ago, and she also had two and a half years of PARP inhibitors. Um, so I think the follow-up frequency is firstly determined um, by, by the um, gynonc group. But for her breast cancer, she did have the appropriate surgery, prophylactic surgery um, for breast cancer prevention since she has breast mutation. So I think that's, that's actually um, appropriate. So I, I think just to address the question slightly differently, when people have had bilateral mastectomies, there's no indication for um, routine imaging. There's no routine mammography. There's no routine breast ultrasound. And we do not routinely do MRI either. Um, if there appears to be an issue with uh, a mass on the chest wall, a problem with the reconstruction or anything else clinically, then we can bring imaging into the picture. Otherwise, uh, clinical follow-up is adequate. Thank you, both of you. And it looks like that's everything for tonight. So with that being said, thank you all of our wonderful speakers for your great presentations. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.